Okay, so, so welcome to the session on dynamic compilation. And um, yeah, we'll have a couple of uh, risky live demos, so, so let's see how that works out. Uh, and I promise a lot of uh, machine code and compiler graphs in this session, and very little formulas. So, but the, before I, I dive a little bit deeper into the subject, I still want to give you a general introduction why we think uh, this, uh, listening to this type of research is worth your time, and why we think uh, doing this type of research is, is worth our time. So originally our title here was actually uh, one VM to rule them all. Uh, but, then, uh, but then people said, yeah, these evil guys from Oracle want to take over the world. So we have a little bit more modest title now. But um, we have here, uh, we were, we were, the reason why we came to this title is that if you type into Google the question, one language to rule them all, like which should be the language to rule them all, you will get a lot of hits. And one of the first things you will hit, you will get is JavaScript. Right? And this is actually probably the answer most, uh, most likely given by, by people nowadays. And uh, then, uh, then uh, second is like a Python. Other people think Python. Python is really a lot better than JavaScript and, and should rule them all. Uh, we from Oracle obviously believe that like Java, right? I mean, Java is, is really the language uh, to rule them all because, because uh, like everything runs on the JVM. And, and our competition uh, b believes uh, Dart is one language to rule them all in 2013. I'm not so sure whether they still believe that, uh, but um, yeah, there is different opinions on which language should rule them all. And um, when you have different uh, opinions in computer science, you, you do one thing, you, um, you like, um, of course, you, you go to Stack Overflow, right? And ask a question and, and see like, um, what the answers are, because, because uh, that's, that's usually very good. And there is such a question on Stack Overflow, which is called, uh, why can't there be an ultimate programming language? which is sort of close enough. But uh, unfortunately, when you go to Stack Overflow, uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, the, like, um, yeah, the, the, question, <laughs> the question was closed. I think, I think it should be open. I think it should, like, it should, it should be open as a, as, a, as, a, as a sink for all of the language flame wars that are going on in the world. And, and they should just uh, use this place. But, but unfortunately, it was, it was, it was closed as non-constructive. And uh, yeah, so, so we also believe sort of that there cannot be one language to rule them all, one programming language to rule them all, but there should be like multiple languages and you select a language for the task, right? And of course, uh, as, as part of uh, the DSL uh, summer school, I, I, I think also there should be even more languages than normal languages, also DSLs uh, that, that, that uh, to, like, add to the mix here, right? And, um, but as it turns out, languages have very different uh, performance characteristics. So um, this is from the language shootout benchmark, where they have a set of very small computer programs um, and very small algorithms. And they have rewritten these algorithms in different languages. And then they measured the time it takes to execute these algorithms in these different, uh, in these different uh, languages. This is a logarithmic scale with lower is better, and it's normalized against C. So, these benchmarks are very small and, and not very sophisticated. And the other thing here is that these benchmarks are a little, little bit biased towards C because some of the tasks in, 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 in other programming languages uh, would be differently formulated or, or, or more complex. So, so the benchmarks are not very good, but it still shows that um, the, the good thing about them is they're really implemented in these many languages. So you, you can really uh, compare compare them. And as it turns out, I mean, there is C, there is C++, Java, Java may be 2x on average slower here. Um, and then there is the dynamic languages. And what you see at the dynamic languages, they're usually about yeah, 10x slower, except <coughs> for one language, which is JavaScript, because JavaScript has, has received a lot of industry attention. So a lot of teams, uh, smart teams, have done optimizations on JavaScript that have brought the, the speed of JavaScript uh, down a, a better, like uh, increased it. And uh, on the very right, you see R. Who of you have, have, has already programmed in R? Good, excellent. That's a good university. Everybody needs to program in R nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah, because it's, it's the best uh, language for statistics. And um, so uh, R is, is actually here about 500x lower than C. 
Uh, to the defense of R, it's, it's R is made for vector instructions or for vector, for vector operations. And uh, what we have uh, here on these benchmarks are scalar operations. But still, 500x is, pretty, pretty, is a pretty big number. And uh, the goal of our project is that, that the, in the end, all of these languages, when you express an algorithm in these languages, they just express an algorithmic intent. And the, the language around it is just some syntactic sugar for expressing an algorithmic intent. And a reasonably smart compiler and runtime should be able to compile these algorithmic intents in a way that you see almost no speed difference between the languages. There might be a little bit of speed difference, maybe 50% up, down, maybe 2x, but definitely not 500x and also not 10x. Uh, this, is, this is something that, that's only justified by, by not enough advances in compiler construction, in dynamic compiler construction, and not by any of the properties of the languages. So is part of your goal here to make C slower? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, C++ plus plus maybe a little bit, but, <laughs> but uh, we, we actually uh, we, 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 we keep the speed of C, and, but we also can execute C in our system at the same speed as the current C compilers. Um, but all of them should be in the, in the same ballpark. We actually have the goal to make C a little bit faster because there's things like in C, for example, if you, if you have a function point in C that you're calling, uh, it will be pretty slow. Like this, this type of virtual call in C is very slow and this type of virtual call in Java is faster because the C compiler does no optimizations when it sees uh, a function pointer um, because it doesn't do runtime optimizations. Bottom line is one. That's presumably the speed in C. Yes, this is one. Like this is like this is like this is zero here. Right? This is one. The speed in C is one here. Right? There's mislabeling somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this should actually say zero here because this is like one is the speed in C. Yes. It's it's uh, it's it's bias towards C. All right, yeah, and uh, because you because want people to choose the best language uh, they, li they like for a task, and in particular, you want people to mix and match languages, uh, to mix and match languages, and, and to, to create larger programs of multiple languages. And when I say languages, we mean, I mean, of course, these uh, programming languages, but we also mean potentially uh, domain-specific languages. So if you embed, um, I don't know, your own regular expression engine in your JavaScript engine, you should be able to combine those two very efficiently. And uh, some people might, might say, now, yes, yes, this, this multi-language thing, I mean, you can run, execute almost any language on, on the Java virtual machine or on the, on the .NET uh, common language runtime. But um, uh, the truth is that you can only execute a language as long as it looks like Java or C Sharp. Um, and this is why uh, this, this way of executing languages on these uh, platforms like JVM or CLR have not been very successful because uh, they compromise a lot. Uh, usually the language implementations are not so fast as the, as the specialized ones and often they also have to make compromises around the type system. So when you are creating a new language, there's a couple of stack steps that you will need to go through. And um, the first step is, well, you prototype a language and you probably prototype it as an EST interpreter. A reason for that is because if you have a parser for a language, you often have natural in EST, so, and you then just write an EST interpreter for the language. Um, but later on, like, you find out the interpreter is not enough, you need like a runtime system around it. You need something that does garbage collection in some way or another, you need something that, that implements runtime calls. So that's sort of the, the next step. Uh, but then people start to play, complain about performance. Let's say you get some users for your language. They complain about performance. And the first step you do is usually then, while well, you define a bytecode format and create a bytecode interpreter. Because bytecode interpreters are faster than EST interpreters in, in, in general. And, um, but then performance is still bad. And then you need to write a shit compiler and improve the garbage collector. And this is when it gets then really very engineering intensive. And this, 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 uh, this list of things is actually matches a couple of very popular languages. Uh, Java is, is one of the popular languages that exactly went through these steps. Like the first version of Java was, was just an EST interpreter. Uh, then they created a bytecode format pretty early on, 
but without a cheat compiler, and then they created later a cheat compiler and created new garbage collectors and so on and so forth. Um, another language that fits exactly that pattern uh, is Python. But they also initially had, a, uh, had a, an AST interpreter, then they created a bytecode format that it can be compiled to, and then later there are projects now like PyPy that create cheat compilers for Python. But what we basically think is that these steps should not be necessary at all, because in the end, once you express your EST interpreter in your language, you've basically told everything. You, like the, the whole semantic of the language is really fixed, because the EST interpreter is giving the full semantics of the language. And all of this other system, like the JIT compiler and the garbage collector and so on and so forth, are standard components that can be reused between all of the languages. So this is why we believe it should be possible to just build the EST interpreter and it's already fast. So this should be all that's needed for your own language. Um, and, and the rest is sort of automatically derived. <coughs> Yeah, and so this is, this, is, this is the goal of the Truffle project, that you can create an ESG interpreter for your language, also for your domain-specific language, and then you, the, compi the compilation step and so on and so forth is all automated. And um, the way we automate that is um, because there is, there is uh, something that's called the first uh, Futomura projection, uh, which allows you to uh, derive uh, compiled code from an interpreter. Uh, by uh, doing partial evaluation of the interpreter with, uh, by uh, assuming the input program is constant. And uh, this is, this is, the, this is the, uh, the approach we take here. We use this partial evaluation. Um, the only thing we add on top is something that's a little bit, um, that makes it a little bit easier to do this for dynamic languages. And the thing we add on top here is First of all, our interpreters are not stable, but they are, while they execute themselves, they change themselves. So I have here an EST interpreter with uninitialized nodes. And then these uninitialized nodes, for example, I have here an add node, it's an uninitialized add. And when it then gets the, the operands, it will look at the types of the operands. And based on the types, it is then changing the uninitialized node to a node that expects only a double or to a node that expects only an integer, or to a node that expects only a string. And um, this node is then just checking that the previous assumption that its operands are an integer or strings or, or, number, or doubles are true. And um, if that's okay, it, uh, it executes itself. And if this assumption does not hold, then uh, it rewrites itself to a generic case. So this is sort of a first step where the interpreter is gathering some profiling feedback automatically and narrowing down the semantics of the operation. And this is very important because the semantics of an add operation in a language like JavaScript is very, very rich. Like if you, if you see A plus B in JavaScript, it's almost impossible to know what's actually going to be executed here because it depends very much on the types of the operands. If they, they could be objects, then you need to call it to, to value, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the whole, like this generic case for a lot of operations is very, very rich. And if we start doing our partial evaluation in a way to include all of these generic cases, then our code explodes and our code is slow. So we really want to narrow down to the case that's actually used at a specific place in the program. Because for one specific place in your JavaScript source program, it's very likely that your operands are either always numbers or always strings or have a certain shape. And uh, yeah, so, so here this, this interpreter is capturing this and as part of its execution. And then in the partial evaluation step, uh, we then assume that this current shape of the interpreter is stable. Because I mean, usually you get the types flowing into the system, the thing is a little bit unstable on the first few executions, but then it stabilizes. Then you get like uh, the same types over and over again, and then you do not actually need this flexible structure anymore. And this flexible structure is also the main overhead in your program, because the main overhead in an EST interpreter is the virtual dispatch. 
so the dispatch between the nodes, right? Uh, and, and we use this re really here for a good purpose because this virtual dispatch allows us to, to switch out the nodes. It allows us to be flexible in the node. But once we think that this flexibility is no longer needed, it's now stabilizing, the, program, the types of the program have stabilized dynamically, then we, we do a compilation via partial evaluation and kind of, for now, just assume that this structure is not going to change anymore. And in this way, we, can, we then get uh, the efficient meshing code on, on, on the right. So I said we assume the structure doesn't change anymore. Uh, actually, it's more like we think the structure doesn't change anymore, but we still need to put in the guards in case we are wrong. Because it's not a proof. It's not, we are not 100% sure that, that this is going to hold for the future. We think these are going to be integers in the future again, but you, know, you don't know for sure. So what we need then is there is in this code, there are still checks in there that if they fail, will be able to fully recreate the state of the EST interpreter and transfer the current execution from the compiled code to the EST interpreter again. So this is a real transfer of execution in the sense of you, you go over your stack, you unwind your stack and you build up a new stack and you resume execution there. You unwind the stack of your compiled code and you create a new stack for your interpreter, you, you, you continue con uh, execution there. And then when you continue execution in this EST interpreter again, now you again have the flexible structure. So you can continue profiling. Um, and in this case, for example, the integer operations did overflow, and so you then get double operations. Um, but uh, after this profiling step, uh, at some point the EST is sta stabilizing again. And then you can invoke another round of, of uh, partial evaluation and create again uh, the optimized meshing code from the EST. So this is sort of the, the profiling, optimization, de-optimization, uh, profiling, and then re-optimization cycle. And uh, in, this, is, this is also the cycle that's uh, implemented in, in, in traditional chits, like in, in the hotspot chit or, 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 or V8 chit. Um, but in our case, it's, it's more that um, this is always transferring from the rewriting EST interpreters to, to compiled code, and the step from the interpreter to compiled code is automated. There is, no, there is no manual interaction with the compiler here. Because in traditional chits, like in Hotspot, the interpreter would have some flag somewhere or, or some, some tables somewhere that it would fill, and the chit would then read those tables and manually add into, into its uh, optimizing uh, phases. And in our case, this optimization really happens uh, automatically. The compilation happens automatically. And the, current, the, the way you reshape your EST tree is going to determine the way the compiled code looks like. Yeah, so this, this de-optimization uh, was introduced uh, by Dave Unger and Urs Helzer. Uh, and this was in the, in the, in the stealth system, uh, if any of you know still about uh, the, the self system. But yeah, so, so the optimization is really, uh, and this is the, this is the, the central key piece that's, that's different uh, here from a traditional like, approach of, oh, I have, have some, I have some source code and now I'm compiling it, now I have some, some optimized code. It's not only that, our compiler is able to at all places in the system to reconstruct from the optimized code back the full state of the unoptimized code. Right? Um, and I will later show you how we do this because we have a, some, some ways in crawl to make this more efficient. But this is a key principle for us. And this is a very powerful principle because this means that the optimized code that we're generating, it doesn't need to be complete. It doesn't need to include everything. At, at any possible point in time, and it says, well, this is a little bit too complex for me here, or this seems um, yeah, bad behavior for me, then I, I just put in a de-optimization instruction and it will, it will fully recreate the interpreter state and bail out of my code. Right? And in this way, these this branches that I do not like to see in my compiler have a zero impact on the performance. So they have no negative impact on the performance at all. Because we can fully, we have kind of this side, side uh, way of execution. 
It's like you have two, two methods compiled kind of, and you can at any point in time jump from your optimized version to the unoptimized version. I mean, theoretically, you could also have multiple of these, right? You could say like, oh, I'm a little bit unoptimized now, I'm entering the next, uh, entering the next. But, but this is really a, a, a key principle and a very powerful um, principle. Uh, yes? So in a language with static types, uh, let's say Haskell, would um, then such a de-optimization and re-optimization still be necessary? Or? Okay, so the question is whether these dynamic optimizations are still necessary in, in, ha in a statically typed language with Haskell as an example. So the answer is yes. Also in, well necessary is, is a, I mean it's, it's not necessary for correct execution. It can be useful also in a static language. And the reason is, uh, let's say I have a C program and I have a for loop in my C program, right? Uh, there is still things I might want to profile here. I might want to profile the number of iterations this for loop goes to determine whether I should unroll the loop or not. Or maybe I can profile that the loop is always executed exactly eight times at runtime, right? Which makes it then very efficient to implement. Or the case where you have a, you have a, function, a, a, C point, a function pointer in C, right? Um, and you, but the function pointer is always going to the same place. I can also do dynamic optimization. So dynamic optimization also can make sense in a, in a statically uh, compiled language. Uh, we just use here sort of uh, types uh, as, a, as an example of what you can profile on, but there's a lot of other things in the program that you could profile on that are useful for the compiler. Uh, the other thing is, for example, aliasing, right? Uh, a C compiler might want to know whether two objects coming in are aliased or not, right? And a static compiler can always try to do code duplication. It can always try to do, well, um, I think aliasing might help me here, so I will put in the aliasing case and the non-aliasing case and, and switch between them, right? So that's usually the approach how a, a static compiler would improve um, the performance. The problem with that approach is that it explodes your code. Because if I then want to switch on aliasing, yes, no, and then I want to switch on whether the loop is eight or not, right? So you really have an explosion of code because a combinatorial explosion uh, because the static compiler needs to have all of the cases in advance, right? And the dynamic approach here allows you to select only the case that was actually occurring. <coughs> all right, yes. Um, Okay, so, so before we finally dive into code, I will just uh, show you here a um, high-level overview of our compilation pipeline. Uh, we have the Truffle EST uh, as the input to our compilation. Uh, then we have the partial evaluation step, and this is creating crawl level, high level IR. This is an IR that's in SSA form, and um, with some type of floating nodes. It's kind of a mixture between program dependence graph and classical uh, data dependence graph with, 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 uh, with a control graph. Uh, and um, then from this high level uh, intermediate representation, we go then to a low level intermediate representation that's no longer in SSA form and that's mostly used for register allocation. And from this, uh, this form, we then go to the x86 assembly or, or Spark assembly. So this is our compilation pipeline. And um, uh, in this, in this uh, summer school today, uh, we will mostly cover uh, some optimizations we do here. I would like to show, show you that. And then uh, later on, we will also talk a little bit on how uh, optimizations of rewrites here can influence the code shapes in this high level graph. And uh, we will also show you uh, the assembly, just that you believe us sort of that we, uh, yeah, what you're compiling here is actually um, accurate and, 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 and not like, uh, doesn't have any additional instructions that it shouldn't have. Yeah, but um, yeah, so this is the, so with this we start the first part of the demos. Uh, the demo uh, that I will show you and that uh, you can also uh, try to do on your laptop as well is we will first show you how uh, an example of partial evaluation and compilation. And we will show you here the compiler graphs in, in the graph visualization tool that we are using and uh, also the assembly. And then I will show you how, how abstractions can be a good thing and how I, you can actually trust the compiler. I would like to actually, as a, as a compiler constructor, I would like to make the case for more trust in the compiler because uh, 
Uh, while for small programs, compilers might do very ridiculous, stupid things that a human can solve better. For large programs, it's very unlikely that a human can solve it better. So I will show you how I can introduce some abstractions into the program without changing its performance. And uh, finally, I will show you an example about uh, the profiling compilation, the optimization reprofiling, and recompilation cycle. Um, in order to, if you want to do the demo on your, on your own machine, uh, you have the instructions. Uh, who of you has, uh, like, has cloned the simple language repository? Excellent. So uh, the first command I would actually like you to, to execute is, um, is the command uh, dot slash IGV. And, uh, and you should check if that works. Uh, this thing that's called IGV is our uh, compiler, our compiler graph visualizer. Um, every all of the scripts are in the in the in the main directory, all of the scripts, and you have a couple of example scripts, so you don't need to pass in special flags and, and so on. So, if I Go here to the command line. I have here um, a, a script which is called IGV, right? And what I want to do is I want to do dot slash IGV. Yes? So you had this slide where you had this vision of making all these different languages run fast. Okay, it's early days. You won't have made them all run fast yet. But how far have you gone? What results do you have? You've told us your vision, but not what your results are. Yes, the results come in the end uh, in more detailed form. Um, so at the moment, our results are that we can run JavaScript competitive with V8. So, and I will show as, as a demo, I will actually show how JavaScript can be faster than Java, which is my favorite demo here. And, um, um, and uh, I will, uh, we have C also in, in the same system, in the same speed. Uh, and we have uh, Ruby at the same speed as JavaScript, which is a new thing, actually. Uh, I think we have, at the moment, the fastest Ruby uh, that's available, um, with about 20x on the, on the, on the second uh, fastest. And um, we have R also at the same speed. Oh, right. That's yes. Very so we have, have R. Java. Do you have Java running as fast as the JVM? Yes. Yes. Also that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's a kind of very impressive. You should say that. <laughs> of course, it, uh, we will we'll come to some benchmark numbers later. But yes, I mean, the, the, like R is actually one of the biggest achievements for us because it's very complex language, and yeah, we have like on, on, a, on a scalar benchmark where you have scalar operations, you can get up to two hundred x. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so this is. Um, you should have, when you open the IGV, you will get like uh, an application like this. And we will later need that because we want to, we want to of course see what the compiler is doing here, right? So let me get you another tab on the shell. Yes. Um, all right. So so the first thing um, that I would like to show you is just um, it's. So what we have here is let me just. Uh, uh, what we have here in order to, to play with for you is um, a thing which you call simple language. Um, actually, while I'm, while I'm doing this, there is, there's another script that you should execute, which is dot slash build, which should build you the simple language. Um, the things you need is Maven and I think Java 8, but uh, there should be instructions there. And so, so we have built a simple language that will demonst that demonstrate sort of some of the capabilities of, of our system. And it's a little bit like JavaScript, just simpler and, and um, yeah, and both in syntax and also in, in terms of um, semantics. And um, we have here a small test harness. We will reuse this test harness for the other, for the other programs as well. Uh, it's a small test harness that um, it's just doing 20 iterations uh, for each iteration, checking the time. And um, it's calling this, uh, this little program over there. Uh, and the little program is just summing up integers. So it's something very, very simple. 
And um, what you can do is um, in the console, we have a couple of um, run commands. I will, I will do the simplest run command now, which is dot slash run uh, example underscore loop dot simple language. And this is just giving me this output here. And should give you the same on your machine. Uh, the thing which you also need to do is dot slash build, which should work. Yes, and if it doesn't work, please raise your hands. We have uh, Christian Hummer here who can, maybe Christian, you move his little bit through the, through the chairs and see if there's any issues. So this is running, uh, this is running on, on the crawl truffle runtime. Uh, the thing that we have pre-built for you is, is the crawl runtime. Uh, this is a modified version of Hotspot that contains our crawl compiler. And then the simple language program, it's just a normal Java program. It can also run on stock Hotspot, so a normal Hotspot, because it, it's just a Java program. Uh, but in addition to that, when you run it on our system, you get this uh, high performance and this dynamic compilation. So the output we get here is that initially the iteration of, of, for, this, for this loop takes about uh, 100 milliseconds. And, but after two or three um, iterations, then the compilation kicks in. This step, like the first two iterations are in this ESG interpreter that I showed you, right? And, but after two iterations, the compilation kicks in. And then we see here some output for the compilation. And um, the third iteration, because the compilation is happening there, is very slow. Uh, but after you compiled here, you basically are very fast. Uh, it's about 100x speed up over the interpreter, which is expected. Yeah, so actually here what we did in order to simplify a little bit the way we test these things, we disabled something that we call background compilation. Usually compilation would happen in a different thread. So the main application is not impacted uh, and you have a smoother performance curve. But it's then less uh, predictable. So uh, for this example here, we have disabled the background compilation and this is why you see re here really the program waiting for the for the compilation to finish before it does another uh, iteration. So the, the output you get here is, well, you get, um, you get here the EST size, which is about 26 EST nodes in this program. It's 26 EST nodes uh, are, are representing this, um, this, uh, this little function up here, this test function, right? And um, uh, then you get some timing uh, results and then you see that uh, there is the number of crawl nodes. Uh, here you get two numbers. Uh, crawl starts with 58 nodes for these 26 uh, EST nodes and then it expands it to about 130 nodes. So, so crawl does a little bit of lowering during its compilation. It, it makes some operations more detailed because then it, uh, crawl can optimize them uh, better. And then the final code size, the machine code size is, is 409 uh, bytes here. So this is sort of the outputs we get here. And uh, yeah, and this is the, 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 the timings we get here. So I told you this is pretty fast, but how, how fast it is, you can only really know when you look at the, the assembly code or when you compare it with Java or something like that. Um, and uh, we can take a look at the assembly code by executing here, not run, but run underscore assembly. And this will give you the same output, except we also have some assembler code here. But this assembler code is a little complex and might need some uh, explanation. So yes, so this is the assembler code here. Um, as output by hotspot, we use here a, a library uh, that's, uh, that's attached to hotspot and that's then printing the assembly code, right? So the top part here you can just ignore. This is just some headers from hotspot that they need for dynamic dispatch. So the important thing for us is the thing that's called verified entry point. This is the first point in the program, right? And so the first thing we see here is a pretty weird thing. I mean, I mean somebody is moving um, 
REX, uh, I'm moving something into REX from somewhere relative to RSP. Uh, anybody takes a guess what this is? Why would you need that? Arithmetics. Pardon? Arithmetics. Arithmetics? No. no. It's like uh, Java is a managed language, right? It, so it should never crash. And, and what would make a C program crash other than a Sackford? How can I make a C program crash? Very badly, actually. Allocate too much memory is a good point, yes, but you can allocate memory or you can, what's another thing you can use too much of? Point of stack, stack, yes, stack, stack, excellent, yes. So you can use too much of the stack and if you hit that limit when you use too much of the stack, you will crash very badly. But Java has this nice feature to give you a stack overflow exception. And not only that, like it creates this exception and gives you a stack frame and so on and so forth. So Java must make sure there's enough on the stack, on top of the stack, uh, sort of that like uh, we can have enough stack available to throw a stack overflow exception in case we hit this boundary, right? And this is the thing which is called like a stack bang, which is kind of just, it's just trying to hit a little bit down uh, the stack and, um, and see that it doesn't sack forward, right? It's kind of, uh, yeah, but I will not, I will not uh, bore you here more with, with, with the gory details of this machine code. Uh, I will, the, the thing which we're interested in, of course, is uh, the thing which is the loop, right? Because we want to know how the loop performs. Because in this whole program, whatever is before the loop, whatever is after the loop, I mean, performance-wise, it doesn't matter because the loop is executed a million times. So anything that's in the loop will dominate, right? And um, we can go to this, um, we can find the loop uh, here. Let me see. Yeah, uh, so in order to find the loop, we must find a way like we must find the back jump, right? Some, um, some jump to a lower address, right? Because that's then the loop, right? Uh, if you can help me find this one here. Um, yes. Yeah, here we are, yes, yes. So um, this is the loop. This is the loop here. Um, this is the loop uh, that is uh, compiled here because here we jump back to FC0, right? And FC0 is here. So this is the back jump of the loop. Uh, this is the loop that was compiled here, right? And well, if you look at that loop, again, the first instruction uh, seems pretty odd, right? Uh, I mean, <laughs> we, are, we are like, um, we are testing something. We are testing some memory location, some pretty fixed memory location. What is that about? GC flag, yes, very good, yes. Uh, it, is, it is the safe point. It is uh, the safe point in the VM because, because Java is a managed system, so we need, might need uh, a thread to stop because of GC, right? And um, because we can't really prove that the, that the loop is, is, I mean, if it, we, we, the loop could execute for a very long time, and so the, the thread needs to check in the loop, sort of it needs to check back whether it should stop now. And the way it's done is with one test instruction that's then uh, triggering potentially a signal handler when the page is protected, and in this case then making the thread stop and GC, right? So this is, this is the safe point in the loop. We could actually now compiler try to, for example, unroll the loop a little bit to make the impact of the safe point less severe, right? Because the safe point in this small loop makes uh, some performance impact, right? Uh, we could also say that, uh, well, this loop is counted, obviously bounded, Right? Uh, so we might not need the safe point in there. Because the only thing for the safe point is you need to reach it within a reasonable amount of time. But the problem then is that you, that you trade off uh, scalability with uh, peak performance. Because if you have a lot of threads and you have loops to execute, and then you, you're not able, like your, your, basically your latency is going to suffer. But yeah, so this, this, is, uh, this is the safe point. But other than the safe point, um, well, in this, in this language, one thing I didn't tell you about the language yet, I mean, obviously you see no types, and, and this is uh, on purpose, uh, because the language is dynamically typed, and um, it, um, it allows overflows of integers. Sort of if you, yeah, the integer is defined as a big integer. The semantics of the integer is defined as a big integer, so it, it cannot overflow. But in order to be more efficient, right, our language tries to 
represent this big integer as a as a machine code, as a as a machine uh, Intel machine integer, as long as possible, because that's a lot more in, uh, concise and fast operation, and you can do faster adds on this one than on a big integer, right? Uh, but and in this case, actually, the sum and the the variable they are all fitting into the in32, so no problems. But we are not sure about that, right? I mean, we would have to prove that. And maybe the compiler can prove it for certain cases, but more often it cannot. So because we cannot really prove that, um, we have here uh, an addition. And after the addition, we have a jump on overflow, right? So this is actually very good on Intel, because on Intel, any arithmetic uh, instruction is setting the overflow flags. So we do the addition, and the only thing we need to add is a, a jump on overflow, because if this addition overflows, then we need to de-optimize, right? Then we need to go back to, to, our, to our interpreter. And um, so this is this thing that's called here jump on overflow. And we have here jump on overflow both for the sum variable and also for the, um, for the loop variable, right? Yeah. Actually, the, the crawl version that, that we're having here we have, like, we have some other crawl version that does more advanced optimizations that would be able to figure out that at least uh, I cannot overflow, right? Because I cannot overflow because I in this loop is bound by, by one million, so yeah, you, you don't need the overflow check. But actually, thanks to the, to the, uh, to the work of Intel, this overflow check is, is pretty, pretty cheap. Yeah. Um, and but then, like this is a this is a branch that we don't care so much about because we hope we never hit it. So we then jump somewhere very much down there. I can try to see if I find this place. Yeah, we can uh, we can jump to this place here, and this place is is setting a couple of um, thread local variables and then calling to the runtime. And the runtime then does the deoptimization logic, right? But from the from the optimizing compiler's point of view, this is like uh, kind of out of the way. It's not influencing the, the fast pass performance anymore, right? Yeah. And um, you see a couple of moves too much in this in this in this uh, code snippet, but um, there is one there is one issue with that we're having is um, this jump on overflows. They are all places where we need to be able to restore the interpreter state. And this gives us sometimes issues because it, it makes some variables to stay alive longer than necessary. Um, and I will show you why that is uh, the case. But, uh, but in, in general, this loop here is, is pretty, it's pretty concise and the Java loop uh, for, the same, um, for the same program wouldn't look any different except for we would not have the jump and overflows in there. But the performance pretty much equivalent. Uh, at least on an Intel box. On, on Spark, uh, the jump on overflow is not implemented, so there you might need the overflow check, and then the overflow check elimination becomes more important. But uh, at least on Intel, uh, jump on overflow is, is, is well, close to free because of the excellent branch predictor, right? Because these branches are, are, are like 100% predicted. Right. Um, Good. So, but, but this is sort of the very low level view. This is, uh, I basically now skipped the whole compiler pipeline. I now went from the, from the EST of my dynamic language uh, to the meshing code of the innermost loop, right? And in order to understand a little bit more about the compiler pipeline, we can also run, uh, test another run comment, which is not run assembly, but which is run IGV, right? And uh, I have my IGV open here, which is important because it's going to send via network the compiler graphs. Right? And um, I do run IGV or run dump. run dump. And run dump is now outputting uh, the compiler graphs uh, to the IGV. Right? It's just run dump example underscore loop dot sl. So if you then go to the IGV, oh, this is, can we like, well, this is hardly readable, but I can, I mean, this is not the most important part. Um, 
Yeah, so, so this, this is the IGV output of, the, of, the, of our high-level compilation pipeline. It's like one, one, of this, like, uh, one of the compilation pipelines, and it's showing the graph after every compilation phase. This is why, it's, this is why it looks a little bit uh, complex here. Right? But I would like to show you the graph after partial evaluation as a first thing. It's kind of the graph that's, that, that the compiler sees after it did the partial evaluation through the EST. And um, okay, so so this is how the compiler graph uh, looks like, and uh, yeah, this is this is good visible. I can actually make this a little smaller. Yes, good. Um, and um, I, I like to explain a few things on this compiler graph. Um, first thing is. The red, the red edges, those are control flow. So this is the classical, like, uh, if you go here, the next thing you should do is go here, right? So this is, this is the control flowing through the system. That's the red edges. And the blue edges, it's data flowing through the system. Uh, so so they are, like, this guy is consuming this guy, uh, this guy is consuming this guy as a data input. And every node is producing uh, maximum one data output. What you can also see is that some of the nodes are fixed to control, but some of the nodes are floating. So they have no association to control at the current point in time. So you cannot really say where they will be placed uh, until you have a fixed schedule. Uh, but um, this allows for larger optimizations because these, these uh, nodes can move within the constraints of their data dependencies. I mean, this is a floating node, but it's pretty clear where it's going to land because it's between two fixed nodes, right? But the data dependency also could be further up and then it's not clear where it's going to be. Um, there is one type of node here, which is phi nodes. This is the nodes that are necessary because the graph is in SSA form. Uh, SSA form means every variable has one definition and a phi node is dealing with basically how data flow and control flow is interacting. So this file mode says, if I was coming from this side here, from outside the loop, right, then uh, the value for this node should be zero, which is C zero here, constant zero. And if I'm coming from the back edge of the loop, then my value should be from this node here. Right. Um, and this node here is an integer add exact node, which is an addition node, but an addition node that will not overflow. So yeah, so in this in this in this graph, uh, we have um, some unbox operation because the arguments are are boxed as, as objects. Then we have the loop, right? And uh, in the loop, we we have the the exit condition for the loop. We compare whether the loop variable is smaller than uh, one. 1 million. Uh, if that's uh, the case, we go to the loop end and re-enter the loop. And otherwise, we go to loop exit and return here. And before we return, we box the value because the return value again is an object. The loop itself has two uh, induction variables. One where you always add one on top, right? And the other one where you always add um, the, the other induction variable on top. And this is exactly what corresponds to uh, this program here. Right? Like this is i, i here is, is my induction variable with plus one, i is, is, is here this one, like this, this, these two nodes are i, and, uh, and some are these two nodes, where you add sort of uh, i on top all the time. And in the end, you box the sum and, and, and you're done. So this graph is a little bit simplified because the reality looks uh, more complex. Um, and in order to see that, we have here a filter that's called remove state. It's removing the frame states, what you call frame states from the program. And this state is really all the metadata associated with the program that allows you to go back to the interpreter at any possible point in the program. And if I unclick here this one, 
it becomes a little bit less readable. Actually, let me, let me undo this. Yeah, so, okay. It becomes a little bit less readable. Uh, the good thing about that tool is we can zoom on certain nodes because now the graph is, yeah, there's too many edges in the graph. It's, it's very hard to visualize. But what's, what's happening is that at very specific points in the program, for example, the loop header, we have these green nodes here. And the green nodes are the nodes that are telling us where we are in the program. And uh, we can double click on a node and then it zooms down on that node, right? Um, and this green node here says, yeah, we are here in an optimized loop node, execute loop. This is one of my truffle nodes. And uh, furthermore, I'm in a SL while node, execute void. And the SL while node is in a simple language block node, execute void. And the block node is in a simple language function body node. And the simple language function body node is in a simple language root node, which is in the optimized call target node, which is in an optimized call target. Right? We can then, this is like, this is uh, a utility for better navigating. This is showing us the hull, the hull around the nodes. So we can disable that, and now we have only the nodes that are just selected, right? And, but now we basically see that at a specific, at this loop that we were talking about here, right? At the loop of the simple language, which is, which is the loop header here, right? Um, we know exactly where we are in our EST interpreter. We know we were executing the optimized loop node at bytecode index two, uh, and we were called from the uh, while node uh, at bytecode index five, and we were called from the block node at bytecode index 37, we were called from the function body node at bytecode index five, from the root node bytecode index five, and so on and so forth, right? And this information allows us to fully reconstruct the interpreter state at specific places in the program. And um, the reason why we do not need it up for every place in the program is that we can re-execute certain bytecodes. We can re-execute certain statements. Like if I do an integer addition A plus B, I can always re-execute that in the interpreter, even if I already did it in the compiled code. So I really only need to go back to the last side affecting instruction, to the last store field, to the last invoke, for example, right? Um, and I can replay from there. And uh, the other thing which we, we need is we also need to state at merge pointers because a control flow merge is sort of, it's sort of a side effect. I need to know where I was coming from. I cannot, when I, when, I, when I go back to the interpreter, I cannot replay if I didn't know from which branch in my control flow I was coming from. So, so we have, and this is why this loop begin, which is a merge point of the loop end and the, uh, the, the edge before the loop is actually also, has also this state associated with it. But in general, we always associate the state with side affecting instruction, such that we can, for each side affecting instruction, go back to it and replay from there. So it's not enough to know where in the program you are. You also need to know the values that you had in your program, right? And um, this is why these this green nodes here have not only uh, sort of a chain uh, of where you are in the program, sort of a stack trace, but they also have uh, associated with them values of all the local variables. Because these are the local variables that you need in order to really resume your, your uh, execution state of your interpreter. It's sort of a full continuation. And we see there's a lot of uh, constants in here. Um, well, some of the constants are nodes, but what is, what is interesting here, for example, is that uh, there's also something which we call virtual object state. Uh, so this is something where we would, um, how we would represent objects that are escape analyzed, right? Because the problem is we can re remove objects in our compiled code via escape analysis, but when we go back to the interpreter, the interpreter needs to see the objects. And so some of the state here also is something that we call virtual state, which is uh, associated with, with an object. In this case, it's, um, it's an, an object array with, with one element, and the virtual object state then has also associated with it the value that needs to be placed in this object array. So then we know when we go back to the interpreter, we need this kind of frame of the interpreter, and we need to recreate this type of object, which is an object array of size one, and with this type of value. Right? 
So the, the execution state that I'm recreating when I'm going back to the interpreter includes uh, the frames of the interpreter, includes the values of the local variables, and also includes if those local variables contain objects that are escape analyzed, also the description for those objects. Okay, and, um, and this is why then, like uh, in, in our compiler graph here, um, when, I, when I go like to the, last, to the last phase here, and let's, uh, um, well, let's, let's keep the edges here. Um, uh, like on, on top right, you have a search box that allows you to search for nodes. Um, and you can just integer add exact I'm doing here, for example. Um, yeah, because a lot of the compiler graphs might have hundreds, thousands of nodes, so you first need to find sort of your entry node into the graph. But uh, we can go to this integer add exact split node, and this integer add exact split node uh, is then a sort of a control flow, like this is this add with overflow, right? This is the add with overflow. If it's okay, you go normally into your loop, but if, it, if it's not okay, you go to the loop exit, you merge, and then you dynamically deoptimize, and now this deoptimize is associated with it the place you go to. It's this this one here, right? And uh, the same also with with the save point. Let's let's zoom on this thing. Um, yeah, you will you will get the idea here. Yeah. So we have uh, here this integer at exact split for one of the variables, which is this jump is overflow, right? Uh, and here we have a dynamic deoptimize, and the dynamic dynamic deoptimize knows then, okay, I will I will just replay from the from my loop header. I will just replay from my loop header, right? Um, and this system of only having this, uh, this information at the side effecting instruction allows us to, to move, for example, this address overflow around because the address overflow doesn't know where it's going to bail out to. It will depend on the place where it's going to end up in, in the program. And the save point, which I showed you before, uh, this is a save point instruction here. And um, this one also needs a, a, an information where it is in, 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 in the interpreter because on save points, if you have class loading or something like that, you might also be forced to deoptimize. All right. Yeah, and, and from, this, from this last schedule, you then go into the low level intermediate representation, do the register location, and, um, and then you, uh, you will um, yeah, create the meshing code, right? Um, one of the things we see here, for example, here, the box instruction, in the, in the high level graph, box instruction is just a single node, but here it's then, uh, uh, it's then lowered to the allocation and to the way you could potentially look up the box in, in the integer box cache. Here, you, here, we, um, here we see the allocation on this side and on the other side somewhere we have, yeah, here we have the lookup in the, in the boxed integer cache. And the way we do this lowering, we can, we can check that out here because the IGV up there has some slider. Let's just look all the nodes again, yes. It has a, and let's reduce, uh, remove state to make it clearer. Yeah, usually when looking at the graph, uh, remove state is really helpful, yes. Um, and uh, the IGV at, like here we have a lowering and um, what you can do in the IGV up there, it's a slider, so you can make a diff between two arbitrary places in the graph, right? Um, in the way you do this. So we make here a diff uh, between two places. Let me see, actually we should like, yeah, we should do it this way. Um, long iteration zero. What we can do is we can here zoom, zoom to a box node and then we see on top on which face this node was deleted. So this node was deleted in this face here because here it's white and here it's black. So at this, at this face the node was deleted. So we can check it was deleted and replaced with what, right? Uh, and uh, now we see, okay, um, in this face the box node was deleted, which was just one node, and then it was replaced with the details of how you would do the actual boxing. So this is the way the compiler graph in the high level looks sort of sane, 
because box is just one operation and then it gets very, very detailed because then you have, I mean, in this case, the box is lowered to, uh, to an allocation and to uh, the lookup in the integer box cache, right? And at the later point in time, the allocation is lowered again uh, into the actual actions done during allocation. But this is why the, the compiler graph nodes usually get more over time. And uh, look, I mean, yeah, it's, it's best to look at it more in the high level because it's easier to understand. All right, so, so that, was, um, that was the compiler graphs here. Let's run that example again so we see sort of the, the impact. All right, um, so this is all good. The compiler com code size is 409 and, and crawl notes. Um, yeah, so actually I need to start uh, an eclipse now. Uh, it, I mean, yeah, there's an eclipse configuration um, associated with that. Uh, as part of the simple language, there's an eclipse configuration. I will yeah, go into this test workspace. All right. So in this simple language add note, oh, I need to increase the font size here. All right, and let's close these windows. So I'm, I'm here going to the simple language add node, which has here a left and a right, okay? And, and of course, I mean, we are executing this now, and what we can do here, uh, for example, is say, I, I, want, I want here like, um, I want here a, a class which says uh, my value, and it should, um, it should take a, a long value, right? And it should be public my value. Because we want to be nice and have abstractions in the program and not these uh, stupid primitives, right? Um, and so we want all of our longs to be boxed in, in values, right? And um, so we have this, uh, this uh, my value here. And then we can, for example, here say like new my value. So we create a new my values from my integer operation and then we get out the value when we do the add exact, right? Um, so I will save this now. It should build the workspace. And uh, in the simple language, I can now execute this again. And my code size stays exactly the same, my performance also. And in order to convince you that what I did had an effect or to check for myself, um, I will dump the IGV graph again. And um, in this IGV graph, in the first, in the first level of it, uh, we want something before we do all this partially escape analysis. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, nodes here. And what we want is we want a node, um, we want to go to the loop node. Yes, so what you see here is, uh, like here in the, in the graph, you see a new allocation of new, uh, I need to make this a little bit bigger, sorry. Um, yeah, here's a new allocation of, of, of the dollar my value, right? This is the class I just created. And then you store the field into this allocation and then you uh, get out the field again and, and with this field you're doing your, your calculation. And the same here, you also create another new SL add node, you store the field and so on and so forth, right? But what we see is that this new allocation node here, which seems an expensive operation, uh, escape analysis is just completely removing that one. And we can go here, actually the first escape analysis seems to be the, the one that's changing here the graph significantly. And um, yeah, here we can see all, 
all the operations that go away in the first escape analysis. Like red means go away, right? Green means newly introduced. <laughs> and among them that go away are also this new uh, my value node. Right? Uh, the, the thing is that in, 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 in Truffle, what we have, for example, and why this is so much, is we have a, a frame. And the frame is, is an allocated object in Java, right? It's, 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 a, it's an array of, of values. Uh, but of course, the frame is local to one method. So we can fully escape analyze it. So the graph here really becomes a lot, uh, basically, like it's, it's losing half of its size, <laughs> right? So everything that's red is gone, right? And after we do that, of course, whatever, in, whatever abstraction I added here in terms of new dialectic objects is gone, right? But, but in contrast to like, um, to like something that we just generated, we also still have the ability to keep this state around. I mean, in this case, it's not necessary. In this case, it's really gone. Because the state where, the state where these, uh, these uh, two objects are live on the stack, uh, they are, this state is, is not uh, a state that we need to dupe to, because it's, it's, it's not something where we would have a side effect. But, but if we would have a state where, where these values are alive, where, because there's a side effect somewhere, then uh, we would, this state would con inc include all of these abstract things uh, that have to be allocated when going back to the interpreter. And of course, I mean, a, a nice value abstraction, of course, needs something like, I don't know, um, a Boolean creator zero or something, right? Um, and, and now I can here see like, yeah, creator zero, um, equals value created zero, right? And of course, of course, all of that just goes away. I mean, yeah, all of that just just goes away. Uh, code size exactly the same again, right? But this makes it this makes it very hard to reason sometimes about the performance because when you see an operation in your Java program, whether this is going to be very expensive or whether this is going to be absolutely free, like zero cost, is hard to tell. And this is why we are currently uh, investigating better methods on how we can give more uh, qualitative feedback to the program about some of this. Uh, we will introduce into the Truffle, uh, this, uh, into the Truffle API something that allows you to assert that a certain value doesn't escape, for example. So you assert, like, I, I, I think this should not escape, this should not have to be allocated, right? And of course, I mean, I mean, you will probably, I mean, probably it's going to be boring for you pretty soon, but you'll probably, like, believe me that I can do this one as well, right? And, and yeah, so, I mean, why not, why not create this thing into an array, right? I mean, it's like, it's just, it's just like, um, it's just completely free, right? Um, yes? But we can see that uh, it takes longer to Yes, correct. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, yes, you can see that it takes longer to compile. It's completely free in terms of peak performance, yes. And the free, uh, yeah, as in, yeah, uh, if you make the compiler faster on some of this, it might be less, uh, less influential. But here we have 500, yeah. It's a little bit longer to compile, probably. With dumping here also. Yeah, we're dumping here without that one, but, but I agree. It's, it's a little bit increasing the compilation time. So what happens if I create a field? So can, can you go mm -hmm. to the you, put, you want to store me this into a static field? Yeah. Oh, you're evil. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Um, well, I can show you what happens then. Um, refactor, extract local variable, my value. And here I will do in, in best software engineering practice, uh, public static, my value. Uh, and with a very long name. And so we, we can have y value, right? Uh, at this point in time, Yes, yeah, so at this point in time, you will run out of luck. Uh, so if I'm now running, yeah, let's run this dump. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, you, you, managed, you managed to trick the compiler. However, that's because we don't control the runtime system. Uh, I think in some of our languages, even that might be hard to achieve. Because you might see that this value is never accessed, and so on and so forth, right? Um, yeah, there's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's a kind of a race between the, when you do micro benchmark against something, it's often a race between the compiler constructor and the guy who is micro benchmarking, who really wants to see the side effect, right? But um, one, one, one comment regarding micro benchmarking, micro benchmarking is really dangerous uh, because, because a lot of our optimizations, they depend on sort of how things fit together and not so much on, what, on the performance of one individual operation, right? Uh, for example, if you want to move read nodes, and then it, it, like the performance of the read node will depend whether write kills it. But you can only measure the performance really like when you have 
all of the nodes together because there's an interplay between the nodes. All right, but yeah, let's, let's go. We are, we are running a little bit out of time here. So I want to still show you one, um, one thing here, which is the example with overflow, right? I didn't show you that one yet. Um, we have here example on overflow. And um, so this is the same example. I've just modified a little bit that the sum is going to overflow, right? And the sum is going to overflow in, 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 in one of the iterations because we return the previous value and we start with the previous value, right? So if I, if I execute this one here, I can run example underscore overflow. Um, oh yes, I have your modifications in your code. <laughs> you, you, uh, you, uh, you like, uh, <laughs> you messed up my life demo here. All right, um, let's see. But these modifications should be fine, um, the ones I have in here. But you might, yeah. Let's see. Yes. Okay. That's, that looks more reasonable. Let's just put it once again so you see it's better. Um, so what's happening here in the overflow case is that while well, we start out with with executing an interpreter, like the first case, a little bit slow. Then we hit the compile uh, compilation. We compile 400 bytes. And uh, after that, after we do the compilation, we run really, really fast, right? Uh, until we hit the overflow case, uh, which we are hitting in this uh, ninth uh, iteration here. And uh, we are already hitting it in this iteration, so this iteration already is done slower. And afterwards, we, we de-optimize. So we run uh, sort of with 200 milliseconds here, because now we need to go to the big integer case, which is slower. But uh, once we uh, re-optimize uh, this thing, then uh, we are again faster here. Not as fast as previously, because we still need to handle a big integer case, but at least faster. But this is one of these, uh, showing one of these loops where we start out slow, then we go really fast, but if we, if we hit some, um, some um, number that we didn't expect, we go a little bit slower, uh, at least at, at first, like a lot slower, right? Uh, then we compile again, and, and then uh, we are a little bit faster again, maybe not reach what we had before, but uh, still compiled. Yes, and, and this shows uh, the power of this simple language and this dynamic optimizations because as long as you're not hitting the corner case, as, as long as you're not hitting the overflow of the integer, you are really, really fast. Um, and uh, in order to show you that, uh, that this is, 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 is competitive with Java, I have here, um, well, here in the end, when we do the big integer, we have about 33 uh, milliseconds, right? And what I've created here for you is um, a Java program that uh, does the same thing that we saw in the simple language program, right? Uh, you can see it's a little bit more verbose. Uh, there's all the types uh, flowing around here, right? Uh, and um, yeah, but it's effectively doing the same thing. It, it, has, it has this while loop with, uh, with i. i is actually specialized in integer here. Um, because it, it, we know that it doesn't overflow. We already did some, some premature optimizations, as I would say it, right? Uh, because I, as a programmer, saw that the, the variable cannot overflow. But for some, it does actually overflow. So we need, for all of the operations, sort of, we need to special case the overflow, and then we need to potentially switch the operation to a uh, big integer. And um, if I'm now um, running this, uh, this Java program um, on hotspot, right? What I'm getting uh, effectively is that um, I'm here, when I'm, when I'm hitting the good cases, I'm getting like eight milliseconds, approximately like that. Uh, and, uh, but after I hit sort of the, the big integer case, I'm, I'm getting into the overflow, I'm getting to 36 milliseconds. But you can compare this to our simple language where when I'm hitting the good cases, I'm basically zero milliseconds. So uh, a lot faster than Java. And I would say infinitely, but yeah, that depends. I mean, it's like, um, yeah, that, that might not be the correct statement, but, uh, but it's a, a lot faster than Java. And, um, and when I'm hitting the, the, the pick and case, then I'm getting uh, to the same speed here, right? Yeah. So, of course, what's also obvious here is that our compilation takes uh, longer. Um, because there's just more, more compilation overhead, but that shouldn't matter for, for long-running applications. And um, 
Yeah, so, so in this case, we are really hitting one of these deopts. And what you can see here, then after we reopt, we have a higher code size because now we also need the big integer case. Yes? Regarding the overhead, um, now it was like 300 milliseconds here, which is not much, but we also had barely any code. So uh, given this kind of code linearly, uh, we could already get something like one minute for compilation for a larger program? Um, no, I mean, most of our, like, our algorithms are like, close to linear most of them in the compiler. Um, the other thing is that this is artificially high because we're running crawl as a Java application on top of the JVM. So part of the timing is to warm up crawl itself. Okay, so basically the JVM that is running the compiler has to warm up first. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. So um, yeah, we, w it's possible to get into the seconds, but, but not minutes. And um, the other thing is usually the compilation will be in a different thread, right? We, here in this example, we really do the compilation on the main thread. Uh, usually we go into a different thread. And uh, the final comment on that is that we still have, I mean, it can still be optimized. I mean, this is a compiler that's like coming from a like, research artifact and we are, we are productizing it. There's a, there's a lot of things uh, good engineers can do about these things, right? Um, yeah. But in general, I mean, this is of course, there's a larger overhead in compile time. I would, I would, I would not argue against that. All right. Um, yeah, these were the, the, the simple language examples I wanted to show you here. And um, just uh, one small thing we have also, there's a JRuby repository where we have Ruby implemented in this system. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, and uh, Chris Seaton is leading that effort. And there uh, we can, um, let me see where we do have that. Um, what is the command we need to do? Um, question, can you check me? Let's uh, no. And then minus. Can show it to me? Yes, accent six. Um, we need your Ruby. Ruby tool and then we need test truffle slash can be fold yet dot rb. Oh, no command match scroll. What is wrong with that one? Oh, JT run. You need to find yes. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. Can we fold that yet? Um, um, I have here my cheat sheet because my Ruby syntax is a little bit rusted. Um, but uh, let's see. All right, all right, that, that was, yeah, that was, uh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was awesome. And uh, uh, let's see, let's see if we can go a little bit further here, right? All right, all right, that's not, uh, that's not, that's not fun. Um, well, the, the interesting thing is, um, well, you can uh, do like um, stuff like uh, one, two, three, and um, how do, this is, I think, a lit, any, anybody of you knows Ruby? Oh, <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's sad. Uh, <laughs> okay, then I'm then I'm uh, then, I, then I'm, I'm on my own here. Um, oh, good, good, good. Yeah, that was lucky. I, I create a literal array and uh, and I'm I'm accessing the first element and I can fold this also to to two, right? Uh, but but to 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 impress you a little bit more here. I mean, of course, we can evolve this thing. Um, or not? Commas. There's commas. Oh. Why? Why would it not like you know? Yeah. You all. Uh, so there's commas here. Let's see if that works. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. That was that was also good. Uh, I have well just to check just to tell you that this is not a trick box here, right? Uh, I mean we can we can see. Yeah, all right, all right. So we cannot fold random. All right. <laughs> so, so um, but I mean, we cannot fold random, random in the general case, right? But, uh, you know, if you do like run smaller 0 0.5, and then we do here like 14 minus 2, 
and otherwise 10 plus 2. And, and it parked this whole, yes, oh, this interpreter. Well, let's see. All right. Yeah, we need an eval around it. Of course, I'm doing the strings here. Um, 10 plus 2, right? Yes. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yes, so, so this, is a, this is a fun tool uh, um, where you can kind of test whether the abstractions that you put in are actually folding uh, to, to a constant, yes? Yes, uh, but I think I think the like um, I think the way this this can be folded works is whether it, it knows the end result, not necessarily that it can remove all the code. Yeah. <coughs> so it, it knows the final result. It might need some code in between that does uh, side effects, but yeah, it, it can fold the final result. I think this is how how this is implemented there. You kind of check whether the return node is returning a constant. You don't check whether the graph is empty. Okay. So so uh, does it check that? I don't think so, but I would have to ask Chris to uh, I don't think so because I think rand will is not pure, right? So I, I think it will. I mean, the next time you around you you do rand, you will get a different number. So there should be some side effect on the system, mm -hmm. but it's checking that the result is kind of folded, right? And and in this case, just as an explanation, uh, I mean, both of these sides go to the same value, and then the phi function that is merging those two branches is reducing to a constant, right? But uh, yeah, nothing terribly surprising, but still, um, yeah, pretty neat. Uh, I, have, I have one interesting example, which is um, what you can do is um, you can like uh, sort arrays in Ruby, right? Um, so we can here do like four, two, three, and then we uh, sort this one, and then we access the first one of this. And, and this basically means that this is the best way in our Ruby implementation to get the, the medium of three numbers. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as a Ruby programmer, uh, I mean, a Ruby programmer really likes that, right? Because that's a nice uh, way to program and not like this, yeah, not this, uh, yeah, no, without considering, just, just <coughs> defining the problem and not considering uh, any, any performance related issues. All right, uh, with that, I will, I will conclude the first session. Um, in the second session, we will see more examples of how you can modify the truffle interpreter and uh, use the truffle to sell. Yes, but questions? The numbers are not constants, so it's going to be inefficient. Uh, no, it will, it will not fold to a constant, but it will still fold to the, uh, to, the, to, the equivalent of, to the equivalent code you would put in if you compare those three numbers. So it will not create the intermediate array. It will not, you know, it's not, it's not inefficient. How does it work? If we have ABC, which are function parameters, uh, how does it? Yes, if you have ABC to this, uh, to this uh, sort function, uh, then what will happen is there will be a for loop that will, um, that will check, there will be the if statements to check which of the one is the, is the middle one, and that will be your code. But there will be no function calls involved. There will be no array allocations involved, and it will be yeah, the same as if you would uh, code it uh, manually. Yes. Uh, is Truffle open source? Uh, yes. So Truffle, Truffle open source. I mean, when we say Truffle, what the main thing we usually mean is the Truffle API, which is the thing languages can build against. Uh, this is uh, currently GPL licensed with GlassPass exception. So anybody who uses it can use whatever license he wants. And uh, as one example there, we have uh, the simple language, which is uh, part of this uh, summer school here. It is uh, released under UPL, which is Universal Public License, which is uh, yeah, permissive, more permissive than, than BSD. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's easy to create pathological cases that it, it, it miserably failed, right? This rounds of optimization, the optimization. So uh, how common it is in practice that in the test cases that you Yes, so, so the question is whether you can have pathological cases where optimization, de-optimization fails. So one of our things in our ESG interpreter is that it must, be, it must reach a fixed point. 
So it cannot go back and forth between two types. That would be not allowed. And, and that's something the ST interpreter writer should ensure. Because you don't want to always opt the opt. Like there should be one generic case that you opt out on when you say like, well, cannot do this anymore, right? Um, there, can be, um, there can be mistakes in the way you, you implement these interpreters. Then these cases can happen, but, but usually you should care about that, that you reach a fixed point. What would happen if I have the kind of common Python, Python idiom that I have one function and I pass in objects of different types? And basically what I want is kind of like C++ templates. I want multiple instances for each type. Yes. Uh, yeah, so, so the question is, what if I have a function where you pass in multiple types and that should specialize for these multiple types? Um, yes, we can do that. And uh, Christian Humer is going to explain that actually as an example in the second half of this uh, summer school. You don't? Mm -hmm. All right, then we, we will work on that example in the, in the break. Uh, but, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so the thing is, uh, what we can do is we sometimes duplicate ESTs and then they special spe specifically for a call site. Uh, there is some trade-offs here because you need, and this way you get some context-sensitive profiling. There is trade-offs here with code size versus uh, speed. So the heuristics are very yeah, hard to do. Uh, but uh, like, often we can, we, can, we can specialize based on the caller, and then we have two different ESTs for the same function, and one is then specialized on int, the other one on string. compilation you might change the program completely and how can you grab the point you know, yes uh, yeah so so the question is how background compilation works uh, background compilation is compiling in a different thread this thread is still watching the est if the est changes while it's compiling it will stop the compilation and just reschedule next time <coughs> all right then um, let's do a break and uh, We'll be back with uh, more, more assembly and, and code examples.